all of us. And we discuss the cool and add your cool block story. This episode of the MS Dev Show is brought to you by Infogistics, providing tools and solutions to accelerate design, development, insights, and collaboration for any organization. This week we have Matt Watson. He's the founder of Stackify, and he's been a Microsoft developer for 15 years and is passionate about application performance. How's it going, Matt? How's it going, guys? It's going good. And Carl, what's going on over there? You look like you're in the dark. I am in the dark, but as soon as I open <laughs> up the window, then the video gets blown away. So okay, just just keeping with this. Yeah. So we're, Carl is video optimizing. That's what you to call it. I'm I'm trying. Yeah, because we're out of, uh, we're out there on YouTube now, so we gotta we gotta look good. I, I put on a shirt today, and <laughs> <laughs> you can't see, you know, if I have pants on, but we'll just assume I do. Uh, okay, so who, what do we have for the uh, Infragistics Ultimate Winner of the Week? Uh, this week, we picked uh, somebody from Twitter commenting on our YouTube, which yep. is what we asked for. And I'm going to murder this name, but it's uh, Sinisa Petkovic. And he said, That uh, looks my, right. <laughs> uh, let's hope so. He yeah. said, My favorite podcast on YouTube. Keep up the good work. Yeah. And what's funny is I read this two different ways. So the first time I read it, I read it as my favorite podcast, comma, on YouTube, you know, because we started publishing into YouTube. And then it was funny, you pasted the screenshot into OneNote and I looked at it again and it says my favorite podcast on YouTube as if it's like, you know, he's he has a whole bunch of podcasts on YouTube and we happen to be the favorite. Either way, it's a very positive <laughs> comment. So thank you so much for that comment. Yes, and if you want to get mentioned on the show, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com. Comment on Facebook, iTunes, or Stitcher. We really like those five-star iTunes reviews. And now, as well, uh, YouTube comments. So yep. we've got at least one. So yep. let's get a few more comments out there. <laughs> and please, and, and please, please, yeah, subscribe out there. Subscribe, subscribe. we got to get those numbers up. So thank you to everybody that has subscribed so far, but just go out there and subscribe because those – those numbers are really important because what ends up happening is kind of like when you when you see something on eBay. Well, this is kind of an old reference, but you know, if nobody's bid on it, you're kind of suspicious. Like Xbox One for you know for free, and you're like, eh, something's not right. Is it a picture of an Xbox or what? So uh, let's get those subscriber numbers up. Okay, let's jump into the news. WebKit updates its prefixing policy. Yeah, so I thought this was really interesting. So in the past, we've all kind of like gone through that you know, that little personal hell when we want to use a new feature and we got to do WebKit dash or MS dash or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, you know, the vendor prefix is. And then they start, you know, it becomes official. So now you got to like go through all your old legacy code. Okay. How many spots did I have it here, but not there. And it's really kind of annoying. So what WebKit is kind of saying is like that vendor prefixing way is bad. So mm -hmm. for, for new features going forward, that they're they're just going to have it be un unprefixed. Okay. However, they're going to have uh, a flag that uh, can be turned on and off in the browser to honor uh, whether or not those experimental items are will be honored or not. So okay. So if you're a developer and you want to use those flag, or if you have those flags in your code, then you basically have to enable another flag. So that I, I'm not exactly how the runtime flag works okay. exactly. Um, however. You know, it, it's nice to not, you know, we can now develop for these features and then not have to worry about when they become official, what exactly you do. Oh, oh it says here, new policies implement experimental features, unprefix behind a runtime flag. Yeah. So basically, yeah, if you want for any experimental new features, that's where you have to do the, the runtime flag. I gotcha. Okay. And then it'll trickle into production. I gotcha. So I'm guessing they, if, if they see... Um, the prefix version, they're still going to, they're going to look at it for the time being. Okay. For the time sense. being and for, and for existing. I just uh, want to make sure they're prefixes. not breaking all my stuff. <laughs> no, they're not going to break it. Okay. Awesome. And they, they specifically said that, you know, if they started just removing it from existing things, that would cause a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What do we got next here? Get coding for windows 10 anniversary edition with the latest preview SDK. Yeah, so if you are on the Insider program and you have build 14.332 or later, mm -hmm. uh, there's now an SDK that you can uh, uh, start coding against. 
And they actually have a list of pretty much every single new, uh, you know, API endpoint that you can hit against. And it's it's pretty substantial. In fact, the blog post that we're going to link to is pretty much nothing but a list of uh, uh, SDK endpoints that you can write against. So if you want to check out a, one of the new features uh, in code, you can see if it's available in this SDK and just go at it. Okay. What's interesting, that first known issue, the desktop app uh, converter preview project Centennial will fail to run on the Windows 10 Insider build 14.332. So that message is there because of me. <laughs> you did that, Jason? <laughs> I didn't break it. I, I made everybody aware of it. Um, it's just kind of this weird like version issue. And probably by the time this episode goes out, I think it's going to be resolved. But if you end up with like the latest build of Windows, you need a corresponding Win, WIM file. Windows uh, image, I think is what it stands for, which doesn't exist. Um, so I had them update, um, all of the public information out there. So all of those disclaimers are from me. <laughs> um, let's see here. Microsoft flow. Have you played with this yet, Carl? I've been, this is on my list. So the, the holdback for me is you need, uh, like a domain join account or an office 365 account for this to run. And I like playing with things with my, my Microsoft account and they don't have that enabled, for that kind of an account. So I kind of, mm. I got the invite, I was excited. And then I realized, Oh, you know what? I can't use this anyway. So I have not tried it, but this is new and it came out this week. So you want to tell us a little bit more, uh, what it is, Jason? Uh, yeah, I'm playing with it right now. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just give me a minute here. No. Now that we have video, I can, I can show. So I actually did have what, what's interesting. So this was actually part of uh, power apps, which was also like a, you had to either get an invite or, or be a Microsoft employee to, to try it out at that point. Um, so I had, I had set up a flow in here and I think I'd even mentioned it on the, on the show. So I have it set up so that whenever there's a tweet with the um, phrase MS Dev Show in it, it would actually save it out to an Excel spreadsheet. And what's interesting, this got kind of forked off of that whole Power Apps thing, and um, my flow actually uh, came through in here. So yeah, I can hit Create New Flow. So basically, it's kind of like uh, if this, then that. Something happens, and then you trigger something else. You hook these things together. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, this gets really interesting too. Whenever you, um, join it with something like Azure functions, which we had talked about a couple episodes ago. So, you know, being able to, to put some custom logic in there, but right now you can do that through an HTTP call, but, um, just looking at the connectors in here right now, uh, let's see here. So there's box, Dropbox, Facebook, uh, GitHub, GitHub one is kind of interesting when an issue is open, for example, um, Instagram, MailChimp, OneDrive, uh, Microsoft Project, um, RSS feed. Hmm, that could be interesting. So when we publish a new episode of the MS Dev Show, we could trigger an action. Um, SharePoint, Twitter. Yeah, so for example, like the the tweet for a new episode could be triggered by this. Um, you know, it could automatically, we could set up those kinds of workflow, kind of workflows, Yammer, Wonderlist, those types of things. So it's all about automating your life in kind of a, a simple way. Um, so I haven't figured out, you know, um, I don't have like a whole bunch of these set up yet, but ultimately I will. And then we'll, we'll have to talk about that on the show. Um, some of the more interesting ones. Um, if this, then that calls those recipes. So, um, in a future episode, we should probably talk about some recipes. Should we move on? Yep. Any comments? Okay. Uh, the complete hardware specs for the HoloLens. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I've been kind of obsessed by HoloLens since I have one. And, uh, you know, one of the things I thought found really interesting is like when going through the documentation and even what they include in the box, they don't really mention the specs of, you know, what it takes, you know, what's yeah. inside, you know, what it runs, how much memory you have. I mean, these are, th you know, things that, you know, I'm not just looking at it to be, you know, you know, interested in how performant it is, but you know, like, I want to know like how many apps can I install? Like how much video can I record off of it before I fill it up or have to, you know, start managing it like a computer. So Windows Central has done the job of kind of just dumping all of that information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that I think is like most interesting is like the storage. It's got 64 gigs of uh, onboard storage, which uh, after the OS and, you know, them lying about how much size it really is, is 54 gigs that are available. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I would say that they're – 
they're they're overly truthful, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just say that because other devices, you know, basically like over provision or they just lie about the amount of space. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you get this much space. And then, you know, the OS is just like, you know, taking up some of that. And they just didn't mention that. So it's really just a difference in how you report it. Yeah. The other thing that I think is interesting is it's got a 16,500 milliwatt hour battery, mm-hmm. which, you know, some people were comparing that to like what a laptop that was 16,000. Yeah. But, you know, I'm comparing it. It's really wow. – I'm comparing that more to a phone because this has an uh, Intel Atom processor. Well, phones so, I mean, are like two or 3,000, right? Yeah. And, you know, at the high end, it's 3,000. Yeah. But 2,000 is pretty common for, a, you know, a good uh, that's smartphone. Gotta be, that's got to be like 80% of the weight on this thing. Yeah. That's a pretty hefty battery. Which is pretty standard for like most electronics now, honestly. Like your phone yes. is like all battery weight. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the HoloLens and real world kind of battery test, it's about two or three hours. So, I mean, that big a battery uh, is letting it go that long. So what's interesting to me, um, and we didn't, we didn't have this story in the news, but, um, and I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what, what the, the details are here, but basically Intel says that they're abandoning all of the, um, at the Atom chipset, which seems crazy to me because Atoms were at the Atom processors were just terrible. And they actually got, they're actually good, you know, starting with like Bay Trail. Basically, they're x86 processors and they're 64 bit. They're really powerful um, processors that use, you know, a fraction of the power. A lot of them can be passively cooled. Um, and I just noticed that the HoloLens uses an Atom processor. So I'm wondering what the, uh, what the plan is there. Because I know Intel also has like the, the Core M uh, line, I believe is what they're called. They have a, a couple of different yeah. lines of processors. So I'm wondering if if that's the idea. Well, I think the problem is, is they're not selling them in tablets or phones. So right. everything that's left over is not enough volume probably for them to that's a good point. really make yeah. a business. Yeah, because they were – I mean it was definitely interesting for tablets. I, I think everybody was getting excited because it's like, oh, you know, the, these keep getting – they keep using less power – yet they still remain very powerful. Now with like continuum for Windows Phone, I mean, everybody, and I have zero inside information, so I can speculate with everybody else. But, um, you know, the idea is like, well, when can I get an Atom processor in my phone and have like a full like desktop PC in my pocket? Um, so it's just, I wonder what happens to that or, you know, if, if that Core M is the, uh, is the answer there. I don't know. I, I've never really compared like Atom and Core M. So I guess we shall see what's going to happen there. Um, oh, and yeah, Carl is <laughs> real-time show notes. So he's putting <laughs> the, the death of the Intel Atom um, on there in the show notes. Um, Azure Cool Blob Storage. So I was going to pick this totally as I, my pick of the week, Carl. Uh, so you just totally stole my thunder. Well, you could have moved it down. That would have been fine. <laughs> so, so this, so uh, you know, just to add a little bit of joking to this. So, I, I've been talking about this a few times in the last day, and I don't think I've called it by the, its correct name once. I've called it cold storage. I've called it slow storage. So, <laughs> everything but cool blob storage. Yeah, cool is like positive. <laughs> slow storage, crappy cheap storage, <laughs> <laughs> IKEA storage. Ikea store. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea here is that it's uh, a penny, as low as a penny per gig in, in some region. So it's, well, so let's kind of back up and we'll, we'll do a little history lesson. And by history, I mean like super modern history. Um, whenever, you know, so there, you know, once upon a time there was, there was blob storage and, and Amazon had, and also has their, their S3 storage. And then Amazon came out with this uh, Gla- Amazon Glacier storage, which is actually extremely revolutionary for the time because uh, blob storage was priced at like 12, 13 cents a gig. Or I should say S3 was priced at that. Um, that was sort of the going rate for that storage. And uh, Glacier came in at like a penny. Now, the only downside was something like Glacier. Um, the rumor is that they used, you know, tape drives behind the scenes. So basically it's, it's easy to write data, but to get that data back, you, you can submit a request and it takes hours before, uh, that data is potentially available. So, um, now, you know, fast forward to today and blob storage is like three cents per gig and it's like, okay, well we're running out of wiggle room for actually saving any kind of money. So now there's this announcement of cool storage, which is, um, I believe then competitive with something like uh, glacier as far as price. And if you look at, um, 
um, the access patterns and everything, I think it's preferable to that because you don't have that huge delay whenever you actually want to retrieve your data. So this is actually pretty viable in an application as as kind of standard storage. You know, so if you if you're building an application that that has sort of high throughput and you're doing like I don't know, whatever your business does, right? There's a whole bunch of different tiers. So you do things in memory, then you potentially do things in like a local cache on your virtual machine, and then you have blob storage, and then this is just an additional lower tier so that you can throw stuff in there and pay less. The downsides are you're going to have a little bit less reliability on the SLA. That doesn't mean it's less reliable. It means the SLA is lower, so it's only 99%. Um, So you have to just make sure you program for that. And then uh, what was the... What was the other thing? I mean, the the retrieval. I think they, I think there's some extra cost on the retrieval because the idea is that you store more than you retrieve. But in any case, this is this is a great option to have so that you can just lower your storage costs. I mean, a penny a gig is is pretty darn good. But I don't know about you guys. I have so many Azure storage accounts that do so many <laughs> different things. Yeah, it's hard to go to any one of them and change it without knowing what I'm affecting. That's the problem. Yeah. That's a hard problem. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure how to how to help you there. I mean, yeah, yeah. It depends on how they're grouped and uh, um, that. Yeah, that's definitely a tricky problem if you have a whole bunch of uh, of different accounts. Yeah, the the one thing that I do like about this though is if you're used to accessing uh, blob storage uh, programmatically, the APIs are 100% identical. Oh yeah, it's the same API. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, so nice. so that really helps a lot just for a developer. You know being able to uh, implement this in yeah. existing code, uh, could it be as easy as copy and paste? Yeah, because like I said, Amazon Glacier is like a to- it's a different API because you you can store data fairly easy, but when you were going to retrieve it, I, like I said, I think there's a huge delay. You say like, I'm going to want this data soon, and then you know Amazon goes like, oh, okay, sometime, and then I'm guessing they have like automatic tape loaders, um, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Uh, okay, should we move on? Yeah. Okay. So today we're talking about Stackify and I want to give a little bit of background. Um, so a little bit of behind the scenes. So we actually get, we get a fair amount of email. Um, and, and this is good. I like getting these. So we get, we get a lot of email on like different companies like, Hey, you know, like, can we come on and talk about this product? And honestly, like we ignore, well, we look at all of them, but we ignore nine out of 10 of them. Cause we're like, uh, okay, your product is maybe cool to somebody, but like, we're just, it's not cool enough for the show. Like we don't feel like talking about it, but Stackify, like we looked at it. It's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I'd like to, like, it's probably something we would have talked about either way. So we're not, you know, we're obviously not getting, we're not getting paid or anything like that. It's not, you know, sponsored by Stackify, but it was just something cool that we wanted to, uh, to talk about. It's just, it looked like a really neat product. So we should just start with a little bit of uh, of background, you know, like what is Stackify? And then also, Matt, we should probably get a little bit of your background and like what your role is there and, and what you do. Sure. So I guess to, to start about me, um, I've been a Microsoft developer for about 15 years, uh, you know, started programming in .NET when the, the betas came out and mm-hmm. um, let's, did some Visual Basic 6 before then. And But uh, I... I started my first company in 2003, and then um, I sold that in 2011, and immediately started Stackify afterwards to kind of solve a lot of the IT challenges I had from mm-hmm. the, the previous company. Um, you know, my, my last company was very high growth, had every problem you could imagine from scalability and performance and lots of bugs, lots of new features, all that kind of stuff. And um, it was always frustrating that me and you know, two or three of the most important developers spent all day with people lined up at our door, right, asking for help and how do I find this log file and all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I decided there's got to be a better way. And so we started Stackify to, to try and do that. And um, Stackify combines a, a lot of cool developer kind of tools together, um, you know, basic monitoring, um, the ability to see all your errors, the ability to see all your logs. Um, and then we combine that with all the application, like, profiling APM kind of stuff that we do um, is, is a really cool combination. Makes it easy to troubleshoot problems in production or, or QA or, or anywhere. Um, and, and Prefix was kind of the, the child of that. We, we decided, you know, we, we've created this all, all this incredible technology for profiling uh, servers. But what if we could take that and util, you know, utilize that same profiling technology for developers? So while they're writing and testing code, 
be easy for them to, to find problems and, and perhaps prefix them before they made it to production. Ah, um, so we don't have to ask, ask where the name came from. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, where the, that's where the name came from. And uh, um, we, so, so far, Tech had a huge fanfare. So we, we first released it about two months ago. Um, we got about 3,000 people that are using it now. Okay. Um, so it's, it's grown pretty fast. And it's pretty cool to wake up every day and, and get all these random messages from people on Twitter about how they like it and stuff. So it's really yeah. Cool. So, you know, just to wrap my head around it a little bit more. So it, it, this sounds like it's really kind of more like a development tool versus something that I would run in production. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. So Stackify's normal, uh, you know, full fledged offerings um, are meant to run on servers. You know, our Stackify APM, and so Stackify APM is um, you know similar to New Relic and, and other products that exist that do code profiling, you know, application performance. Mm-hmm. Um, where Prefix is designed to run on the developer's workstation, mm. um, and Prefix is free. Um, so the actual engine underneath that that collects all the data is exactly the same that we use in production servers. Um, it actually took us about a week to make the original prototype of Prefix and slapping it all together. And then it's taken, you know, three or four months to do all the fine uh, details of it. But um, it's a really cool free tool and, and we plan to keep it as a, a free tool. Okay, that's awesome. So so what does it actually work with? I, in, in just so people know, I think you can just go to demo.prefix.io. Um, Correct. Because, you know, I can I can look at like, Actually, you didn't have like a lot of marketing speak or anything, but you know, I can look at that all day long. It doesn't tell me anything. I love it because it said, you know, like try it now, and I click and like boom, like I'm using it, which is right. which is awesome. So I, you know, I see in here um, that it's it looks like it's hooking into some some kind of .NET web application, but like what types of technologies does this work with? Yeah, absolutely. So, by the way, if you go to our website, which is just prefix.io, there there is a um, a short little sixty second video that kind of oh, okay. talks about what it's what it's for and what it does, and and then there's the demo site uh, that you mentioned you can link to that's kind of a um, it's running on a VM in Azure that's just real time um, data that's going through it. But so prefix works with any kind of ASP.NET application um, all the way back to two o all the way all the way forward, um, and we even have um, some some support for ASP.NET Core. Uh, okay. RC one, um, and then when it goes to RC two, we'll we'll update that, and we'll we'll keep chasing the ASP.NET Core side. Um, but it supports uh, web forms, a, you know, uh, MVC, Web API, WCF, ON. Um, we even support some third party stuff like uh, Nancy and Service Stack and some other uh, content management systems, all that kind of stuff. So we're um, we automatically profile. You know all the interesting methods in .NET, and so what's really different about Prefix as a profiler compared to say something like Visual Studio's profiler or Ants or Just Trace or all those tools um, is it's very lightweight and it, it's designed to run in the background and run all the time. Mm. So you know in a standard um, standard ASP.NET request, there's literally thousands, if not tens of thousands, of methods that call. They get called in one request, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're running a, a low-level profiler, that's a lot of data to collect and inspect. Um, where typically we only may track, say, 50 methods in a request for a simple request. So that doesn't add a lot of overhead, um, and it's based on the same technology we use on production servers. So we have people that have you know hundreds of requests per second, you know, and if we're doing 50 things per second, that still seems like a lot, but we've, you know, it's very finely tuned C++ code, basically, okay. um, that uses the .NET API. And so we're able to uh, not have a lot of overhead while you're, while you're running on your local machine. Um, yeah. I've used some of those other profiling tools, like you mentioned, like Ants and, and some other things. And they, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you like hit start, you know, in kind of the critical time. And then you turn, yeah. to, at least back when I use it, I guess machines were a little bit lower powered, but then you'd have to hit stop and it's like, and then you just sit yeah. there and wait for it. You can never keep it running too long because it would just explode. And honestly, like the problem's going to be in my high level code anyway. So, right. you know, this gives me 99.9% of, of the information I want anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So tools like Ants and, and, and those other tools are fantastic tools. Um, 
but they're not tools you use every day. They're they're usually tools you use yeah, when there's a, couple a problem times a year. Yeah. And usually when you're using them, it's a bad day, right? You're trying to find some really bad CPU or memory problem. Yep. Or or if you're working with a specific app where CPU tuning is really important, then then you would use it. Mm-hmm. Um, we use it actually. We use those tools actually to do performance tuning of our stuff because since we you know since our stuff gets installed on people's servers, the overhead of it is is really critical. Yep. So you know we we do you know some of those sessions. But to your point, prefix is 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 designed to be something that you can use every day. Yeah. Um, we, we've been doing some interviews with some of our early users to, to ask them about what they like and how, how they use it and stuff. And we asked a guy yesterday, you know, to use it every day, to use it every week. And his answer was 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> so, um, I always say worst case scenario, it's the best log viewer you've ever seen Okay. Uh, because it can automatically collect all your, uh, debug statements, trace, right line statements, and then in log, log for net, Sarah log, all that stuff. And it, and it breaks them down by request, so you can, you know, by web request see um, the logging. I mean, it's, it's sure beats chasing log files and the spaghetti that those can become. Well, and and I like the fact that that you use it all the time because, like ants, like you're right. I only did use it. It was it was always when I was I was in a tight loop. You know, I was doing like some parsing right. or something, and ultimately, like this one little function would get called ten thousand times. Exactly. And it's like, okay, what what exactly? is, is causing this, this small delay that's just, you know, accumulating really high. So the tools that I tend to remember are the ones that I use all the time. And especially whenever I set up a new system, if it's not something I use all the time, like it just sort of gets installed on demand. And at that point I'm just like, yeah, do I really want to install this? So I actually like the fact that, um, this is something I I could, you know, maybe even, I, I don't know, do you do this? Do you have like a monitor just for this? Um, so a lot of the people we talked to do, yeah. The, okay. the guy that I mentioned yesterday, he, he actually said he had three monitors on his desk and one of them had prefix. One is a prefix the monitor. Yeah. I can see and, that. And, and some of our guys in the office are that way too. Um, be, because it, it lets you see all the web requests that are happening in real time. Right. And you can see all the SQL queries, um, web service calls. Um, we automatically instrument all the common, uh, Microsoft libraries, but also a lot of common third party libraries. So we support, um, things like Redis and Memcache and um, in-service bus and you know all those uh, common libraries you use for queuing and caching and um, all the database providers, you know MySQL and you know all that stuff, along with all the Azure libraries, all the AWS libraries. So you mentioned Glacier earlier. So if you have code that reads or writes from Glacier, Prefix automatically would see that and tell you that. Okay. And then and then where we can, we actually do some extra work to show you, um, for example, if you're writing to a, Redis, like what key did you access? What key did you read and write from? So, you know, prefix isn't necessarily all about performance. It's about debugging. It's about helping you understand what your code is doing and the behavior of it as well. So, okay. So, so how does this compare to other tools? I know you have a, a a page on your site talking about how it compares to Glimpse. Are there other things that it compares to well, or is Glimpse the closest thing? So there's there's Glimpse and then there's the Mini Profiler, which I think is kind of sponsored by um, Stack Exchange, right? Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's about it. Um, outside of .NET, there's a couple other things that are similar, um, but within .NET, that's really it. And you know, Glimpse is fundamentally very different. Um, you know, since we're uh, Prefix is profiler based, we have access to a whole lot of uh, data that that Glimpse doesn't, right? Um, Glimpse requires a lot of extensions and plugins and 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 through that it, it can it can gain some additional information um you know glimpse for example uh, can't see any external web service calls it, ha- it has no tracking of those um but we ha- we automatically support all web service calls that are made it doesn't matter how they're made um so you know we just have access to a lot more information because we're you know tied into the net profiler okay um, so, so what information, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things that it, it instruments by default. Um, I mean, I see like SQL queries in there and you mentioned a couple other things. Is there like a complete list of what I get out of the box? Yeah. On our, in our docs, we have a, um, I think a doc called what does prefix profile. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's, that's it's what I'm looking the, for right now. Yeah. It's, it's, um, at docs.stackify.com, yep. I think. And, um, yeah, it's all the common things, all database stuff, SQL stuff, web service, um, but but we go a lot further than that. So that's that's a lot of the. Um, oh wow, this is a big list. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's, it's and you it's want that list, list to be big because like you were mentioning like Glacier, but even Azure, uh, there's SQL Azure, 
uh, storage, including yeah. uh, blobs, blobs, queues, and tables, yep. document DB, Azure Service Bus, caching. That's awesome. Yeah, and so that's what's really awesome about Prefix is when you install it, it literally takes like a minute to install, and all that just works. There's no code changes, no config changes, nothing. It just works. Um, that's what's really beautiful about it. So um, you can, there's actually a way also to um, profile your own code as, as far as your own method. So if there's methods that you want to track and show in Prefix, there's a way to do that as well or in some other third-party library that we don't support. Um, but our goal is to support as many common things as we can, and we continue to add to it. But we also do a lot of other things that are really smart. So, for example, when a um, if you have like a web API uh, endpoint that somebody's posting data to, mm-hmm. you know, we track how long it takes to read that data, parse that data, deserialize that data, right? Oh, that's um, awesome. For a, re- a really simple request, it doesn't take a lot of time. But if somebody's sending you, you know, say five megs of JSON, like that can take a hundred milliseconds, a couple hundred milliseconds, and usually that's time you would never have any idea where it's spent, right? Um, Prefix actually tracks all that kind of stuff. Um, it also tracks uh, the responses. So, you know, if, if your response from a, a call is a bunch of JSON or a bunch of XML, we track that and, and we tell you how long it took to write that response. Now, maybe there's nothing you can do about it and it just that's how long it takes. But at least then you understand how long it takes instead of it being a mystery, or you can figure out how to trim down the payload. So okay. We, I have a whole blog post that I did that compared um, reading incoming data and all the different ways to read incoming data from MVC, Web API, WCF, and all that stuff. And you know, there's ways to read it as a string or just a byte array, or or let .NET automatically you know deserialize it for you. And I I did some comparisons of that stuff if, if you're really interested. Yeah, no, I love this because I, before Glimpse existed, I had written something similar, and I think I have a blog post from, uh, what the heck, that would be six, seven, eight, at least eight years ago. Okay. It would, you could put a special parameter at the end, and it would pop up this thing that would give you, you know, like sort of what was going on behind the scenes. It was incredibly valuable. I was trying to get everybody to do that, and I love, I love the the demo that you have out there because, it's extremely insightful. Like you mentioned, the the web calls. Having all that information, then all the database calls that are happening, I love. Um, yeah, it's doing a, a a request here, getting back a status of two hundred, um, and then it has the response HTML in there, and you make it really easy to read. So this, I, it just it makes sense to just have this running, like you said, all the time, um, showing you what's going on. Because sometimes, you know, you you test you test locally. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is really fast. And here it's making 50 extra calls that it shouldn't be or it's doing some garbage. Right. And, uh, yeah, good, yeah, good examples of that are things from Entity Framework or in Hibernate where yeah. you, use, <laughs> you use an extra property or something in your MVC view, right? And all of a sudden that causes it to do an extra database call for every record that it binds. Yeah. And you just have no idea. Yeah. Um, we, we, also do some, we also track some other things that are really insightful. So, for example, you can make a web service call and it might take 100 milliseconds, but if it returns a whole lot of data, it takes a lot longer to download that data, mm. right? Just think about downloading like a giant PDF file, right? The the server so will it's quick to kick off the process, but then the streaming yeah. of the data back can take a long yeah, time. Yeah, so the you know the server will respond with the initial response and the headers, and it'll say, okay, you know, here's the response stream, and just like we code it, we you know we get the response stream and then we read the response stream. Yep. Well, that's a whole extra amount of time, and a lot of times tools. Uh, don't show any of that, so you have no idea how, how long that takes. So Prefix, in a lot of scenarios, tracks that kind of stuff. And an even better example for that is actual SQL queries. So one of the things I, I found out um, along the way here is all the SQL reporting from SQL Server and most all those tools is wrong because um, it just shows you the, the server's point of view of how long the queries take. So a really simple query that returns a lot of data, the server might say it takes you know a few milliseconds, but it could take your code a few seconds to actually download that data as far as the impact it has to your app and your users. Um, you know, just if you think about opening a data reader and just looping through the data, right? If it's a lot of data, that takes a lot of time. And Prefix can actually track that um, and tell you how long it took to download those query results. Okay. I'm just looking. So it looks like you can hook into Log4Net, for example. Um, and it looks like a, you have an, a, you, you basically built a custom appender to send data over to log for net. Um, so my, I, I guess that 
one thing that I want to understand that that's awesome because that makes it really easy on me. Um, one thing that we, I guess, totally skipped is, is this ultimately a service or does this run locally? And I, maybe it's, you all it's all local. It's all local. Okay. Yeah. Pre- prefix is a hundred percent local. Um, and we have a whole data collection policy in our docs that talks yeah. about, um, about the, that subject. Um, but yeah, the data is all hundred percent local, okay. um, which is different than our normal APM product, right? Our yeah. normal APM product you install on your servers and then the servers stream that data up to our cloud and, you know, we process the data and do all that stuff. Um, but even if you're in a company that is very cloud adverse, you could still use prefix potentially because none of the data leaves your, leaves your computer. Okay. So cool. Could, could I put it in the cloud then if I wanted to? So you can actually install prefix on a server. It, it will work. Um, the UI is not highly tuned for um, very high request volume. Yeah. So, if, I mean, if you installed on a server that doesn't have a lot of traffic, it'll, it'll definitely be fine. Um, you know, you can only see about the last five minutes of data. Um, and Well, I'm actually wondering, like, I, I, this seems silly, but I'm doing local dev, but I just want to keep my prefix installed in, uh, you know, in a different machine up in Azure. Yeah, you can. Okay. Well, I mean, it'll only show you the traffic on that machine. Oh, okay. Okay. So I want to install it on the machine where I'm actually doing development. Okay. Where, yeah, wherever the web server is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just because I can do something doesn't mean that I should. I was just asking. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, we've had people use prefix for load testing and stuff like that before, and, okay. and it will work. And we're working on making some enhancements to the UI to make it uh, work better under very high load. But, you know, it's not designed to do like virtual scrolling yeah. and some of that. So, you know, you add 10,000 items to a list and the doc in the dom and it gets kind of slow and okay browser freaks out but for lightweight usage on a day-to-day basis it literally takes like zero cpu so okay. it's it's very efficient for that okay so with log for net i obviously have to add an appender for all these other things do i have to do any integration work or or what what do i actually do to integrate those things so all the all the core things that we support don't require any uh code or config changes really the okay. only thing that really does is log for net or in log Okay. Um, Do I just include an NPM and it kind of hooks up whatever it needs to hook up? Yeah, it's just a NuGet package. Okay. Yeah, or, yeah NuGet, sorry. Wow. <laughs> well, it's just wrong, a wrong language. <laughs> now, we, we do have a Node package too for uh, Node.js and we have a, a Ruby <laughs> gem. And, okay. okay. Yeah, we, we support other programming languages. For now the you're language. talking my language. Yeah. Okay. So does Prefix integrate back with Stackify in any way? It does. And um, so... As I mentioned earlier, Prefix is free. We're working on a paid version that's going to do some more advanced things. Um, one of the things it already does in the, in the free version is you can put in your, your Stackify login. And when you're working locally, if you're on an uh, app and a URL that um, APM is installed on and say QA or production, it recognizes that and it'll pull down stats from those environments and show you, you know, how often is this URL used in those environments, how, how many errors does it get, how fast does it run. And then with one click, you can drill into APM and it'll show you all the details that, that you'd want to see from QA or production or whatever. So it links you right to it. Okay. Um, so one thing that I had in my head too, like I, usually, I shouldn't say usually, um, often I'm building some kind of application that's ultimately going to run on five different machines, right? It's some kind of distributed application and the nodes are all doing different things. Right. Um, so how does that work? Cause obviously like when I'm doing development, if I have, let's say I have five different websites and they're all sort of working together, let's just say they're microservices. That makes it real easy. Okay. I have sure. five, five microservices and, um, they're all running locally on my same machine. Am I able to see the log messages sort of interwoven? Because I see those five microservices as a single application. I want to see everything together. Is that possible or am I crazy? Okay. So there's, there's a few things there we should discuss. Okay. Um, so on your local machine, it's going to show them all as different web requests, and you would view your log messages and SQL queries and all that stuff that happen per request. They're they're grouped by that request, right? Okay. So that makes it easy. Yeah. You know, and, and if you have one one thing, you know, one request that kind of called all the other things, then you'll be able to see that in the in the main request. And in the next version, we're getting ready to ship. It'll actually you'll actually have a button where you can. Where, like you'll be able to see, okay, called this web service, and we'll have a button there that says view the prof- the trace for that, and then you can actually jump right to the trace for that. Does that make sense? Even though it's all on your local machine, yeah. So it'll it'll let you 
it'll it'd be in your list somewhere too, but it'll okay, let you jump right because, to that. Because because one microservice is seeing it as an outbound request, the other one is seeing it as an inbound, inbound request. Yeah. yeah. So yes. you're saying you'd be able to jump between those then? Yep, you can jump between. Okay, them. that's awesome. Because yeah, yeah. basically, it's like it's like the the problem that the cloud introduces is being able to trace yes. something as it flows through the system. And I actually built something really half-assed. Um, it was it's actually awesome for this type of scenario though. It's called uh, logforstuff.com, and it's really just to, to show log, real time log messages. But it just puts them all in into a big pile. Right. Um, so it sounds like this essentially does something um, similar whenever I'm doing the development, being able to link those things together. Yeah, and so that's and, awesome. And prefix groups them by request. Now, yeah. as part of our other that's, that makes offerings, sense, though. as part of our other offerings, one of our tools does log management. So yeah. it it takes logs from all servers and apps, and and kind of does what what you described, where it puts them all together in a log viewer, and you yeah. can search them and stuff. Um, and, and people can use that too. So the the other thing we're we're working on right now, I've actually been working on this week. Um, back to what you just mentioned is. What happens when you call a web service call that is potentially on another server? Yeah. It's not on your machine. Yep. Um, we're working on a way that we'll be able to show you that too, which is going to be really, really killer, right. I think. So when you, your your code called a web service call that could be anywhere on any other machine, being able to see what did that code do on the other machine mm. and pull that all the way back down. I'm guessing it would also have prefix installed then? Yeah, it'll have to have our... Um, APM installed on it. Okay. Um, but one of the things we're going to do when we do the paid version of Prefix, prefix and, and Prefix is going to be really cheap for the paid version, is give you a license to also install on a server of APM. So it'll be kind of a two for one. So then you can install it on you know two or three of your, your test servers, your QA servers, dev servers. Yeah. So then all of this will work. Okay. So is what we're thinking. And so we're, we're working on some uh, more advanced features like that. Um, we find most people that are using Prefix are using it for debugging type purposes. And so we're, we're just trying to do everything we can to, you know, simplify that for people. Yeah. Cool. So is there anything else on your roadmap that you could share with us? Um, you know, on the, on the Prefix side and APM side, both, it's just continuing to improve, um, kind of every aspect of it. So I, I mentioned that earlier we're, uh, doing custom, you can do custom profiling. So in the next version, we're going to have this really cool UI that actually uses um, Cecil, Mono Cecil. I don't know if you've heard of that. No. But it, um, we go through all of your uh, DLLs and assemblies for your app and then give you this really cool uh, UI so you can go in and pick certain classes or methods that you want to profile. Mm. So, you go, so then um, Prefix will start profiling those additional methods, which is kind of cool. Oh, okay. So if you have your, you know, if you're trying to work on something in your code and, and you're not mm-hmm. sure what's slow about it, like you mentioned earlier, you know, it's like the certain loop or whatever, mm-hmm. you can go in and, and you could click, click, click and, and, and pick those classes and methods and then restart your app and then prefix will um, start profiling those methods and show those in the traces as well. Okay. So that's going to be pretty cool. And then we're working on a bunch of um, JavaScript related things. So, so think about like a page load time and resources and uh, JavaScript errors, all that kind of stuff too. Okay. Yeah, so that's all all that's, all that's going to show, show in there. And, you know, I mentioned earlier or, or just a second ago about the rem- re- like the ability to view a remote profile trace. So think about people that do a lot of front end work. So they're doing a lot of angular or all that kind of stuff, single page apps, and maybe their app calls a whole lot of web services, but maybe they didn't even write the web services. The, the ability to have us catch those requests that are happening in the browser and, and see them in prefix, but then also know what web service calls they made and the ability to see those profile traces is mm-hmm. going to be really cool. So even though you're a developer working on the front end stuff, you'll be able to see, have some visibility to what's happening on the server side. So you can at least help troubleshoot it. Yeah, it's absolutely. Gonna, it's going to be pretty cool. So we're working on a lot of cool things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it seems pretty comprehensive. Like I said, looking at the, you know, what it profiles out of the, out of the box. So how do I, how do I get started with the, um, with the Node.js version, is that just an NPM then that I include? So the only thing we support on Node.js is um, we don't do full APM or prefix for it. We just okay. do logging. We just do logging. Okay. So if you're using our logging product, you can use like, a, I think it's Winston and yeah. some other libraries um, to, send, to send us logs. Okay. Errors and logs. That's yeah. still useful. Okay, pretty cool. Um, anything else that we uh, that we didn't ask you that we should have asked you? Um. One of the other things that I wanted to mention that Prefix supports that most other tools don't is actually async. 
Um, Prefix fully supports async stuff, um, where a lot of other tools don't. A lot of yeah, other APM usually tools problematic. Don't. Yeah, um, we've worked very hard to to support it, and it it all just works automatically. So we automatically track all the async methods for all those um, libraries that you know we were discussing earlier. So, okay, very cool. Just pretty cool. All right, so one final thing that I wanted to ask you that I did not put in 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 any uh, preview questions was, you know, one of the first things I do when we look up uh, guests who are going to be on the show is we go to their Twitter handle. And I noticed at the at Stackify Twitter handle, it mentions that you have a dev of the week. Can you explain what's up with that on your on your on Twitter? Uh, so our our marketing uh, team had this great idea a couple weeks ago and just started doing this where one of our developers is kind of uh, manning the, the Twitter channel every week. And uh, it's an experiment. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, I see. I was going to say, I'm like, why is there like a person's picture there? Yeah. So like so, that's, he's like the guy of the week. Yeah, he's the guy of the week. So yeah. uh, that was uh, an experiment that we're doing, I guess. So he, so since he's the the Twitter person of the week. Yeah. Um, he's the one that just like monitors it and retweets. I think so. And yeah. tweets stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's That's kind of cool. We're doing. Yeah. Yeah. He did tweet us. So he, I, this, I, I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> he's doing a good job. Good. Okay. Should we move on? Yep. Okay. Let's see. Azure pick of the week, Carl Stoll. Uh, let's see. What do we got next? Uh, dev tip of the week. What do you got, Carl? So, uh, lately at work, what I've been doing is I've been doing like a lot of documentation of kind of like uh, architecture and, you know, I've been doing a bunch of cloud things and, you know, out, Visio is kind of my go-to tool to do stuff like that, mm -hmm. except that it doesn't have like the latest and greatest Azure stencils. Yep. Well, Microsoft has uh, graciously uh, made this a free download. It's called the Microsoft Azure Cloud and Enterprise Symbol slash Icon Set. Visio Stencil, PowerPoint, and PNG. So we got the good old Microsoft naming convention there. Yep. We have mentioned uh, this before in the show, by the way. But it's uh, been it was a while. A long, it's been a while. It was a long time ago, and it wasn't the dev tip of the week. No, it wasn't. So, uh, so I, I, use, been, I use the PNGs in uh, ArmViz. So, yeah, I've been using these stencils, uh, the Visio stencils, all week long, and it's been actually uh, making whatever I've been doing look a lot better. Yeah, no, they're awesome. I did that. Uh, I was working with a partner, and we kept whiteboarding something. And then, and then about eighty percent of the way through, I said, "Okay, let me clean this up. Let me get this in Visio form." Once we kind of had it worked out, and I just sat there for like five minutes, just drawing what we had on the whiteboard. And they, they were both sitting there, and they're like, "Wow, you're amazing! <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you do that?" And it was it was because of these stencils. So I was a hero because of these stencils. So that's my endorsement. Okay, so. Matt, we play a game on this show. Okay. Uh, what I need you to do is pick a number between one and four inclusive. How about two? Number two. This is a game for kids, I'll warn you. <laughs> well, this is an easy one. Uh, would you rather have x-ray vision or be able to fly? Uh, I think fly. Yeah. What I, What use is x-ray vision? Seriously. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it, 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 X-ray vision is not the ability to see through things, right? Like it's X-ray vision. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. nice skeleton you got there, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> I think flying would be pretty this cool. There's a joke about big bone. I'm not going to go there. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh. Carl. <laughs> I'll take number one. Okay. Number one. Uh, would you rather walk, to, and I got to cross off this other one. Would you rather walk 10 miles in squishy mud up to your knees or walk the same distance in snow up to your waist, a aka living in Wisconsin. <laughs> you know, I think that living in Wisconsin, I think uh, snow is a lot easier to walk in than mud. So I will choose the snow. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's just oh, up to your knees. Oh, okay. I was thinking, I was thinking the mud was like an inch deep, but it did say it's no. squishy mud up to your knees. So yeah, that, that's right. that's pretty hard. Yeah, no, you would just be because because there, there's like this whole suction effect, right? Yep. With uh, with the snow, I don't know. Snow is terrible. Can you even walk in snow up your waist? Uh, I have. Uh, it doesn't really look like walking. It's more of like uh, controlled rolling. <laughs> 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 I did it the one time. My yard, I think it was last year. I mean, we had like, you know, three, four feet of snow. Uh, it's just, it took me forever. It, it's like, it is nearly impossible, but you just sort of like roll through it. And <laughs> yeah, anyway, <laughs> some good visuals there. 
Uh, let's see. Okay. So Matt, where can people find you to learn more? Uh, they can definitely check out stackify.com. Okay. Um, you know, and prefix is at prefix.io. Yep. Um, and then my own personal Twitter handle is at Matt Watson 81. Okay. I am following you. <laughs> okay. Carl, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. Okay, and you can find me at whytechie.com or on Twitter at twitter.com slash whytechie. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming on here and talking a little bit about Stagify, a lot about uh, Prefix IO. Uh, very cool topic. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. I wish I would have had this a long time ago. <laughs> so have you guys used prefix yourselves? I haven't, no. No? Okay. No, part of it is I don't do a whole lot of .NET these days. Okay. So that's that's like my biggest problem. So do this a lot of node? Yeah. Yeah, so this would have been awesome. Jason and I used to work together about you know, like four or five years ago, mm-hmm. and this would have been awesome for then. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we – Cause we were pretty, st- we, we, we always wanted to like test the performance of like the database calls. That's really like sure. the biggest thing for everything. Me. Yeah. Very I mean, it's like how many database calls are you making and, and how, and how long are they taking? Cause they well, and, just, really- and being able to see the database calls. Yeah. Right. I mean, especially if you're using entity framework and these things, a lot, you know, the, what your query actually is kind of really gets abstracted away. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we actually had it. a, we had a pretty obscure development process where we use link to SQL and every uh, query that we wrote in link to SQL, we actually had to go through SQL profiler and grab that exact thing, then run that query that was actually generated mm-hmm. in profiler. I think that's in to uh, see the performance. I think yeah. it's in uh, what is that link link pad or whatever. I think it does that now. Yeah. But back then we, yeah. that was part of, you know, what we needed to do to check off as a complete features. We had to go through all of those steps yeah. and you had to, cause I remember, I remember, I think you, there was one time that you didn't do it, Carl. And, it, <laughs> and I'm not saying it like a bad thing, but like what ended up happening was like, you, you know, the database query sucked and it wasn't your fault. Cause you know, what ends up happening in all these languages and you're writing the link, there's a disconnect and you have to look at both and you have to learn both. Like there's no developer out there that knows link that doesn't know SQL and is actually like writing good code 